Whenever I see your face, I always remember our late, our friend. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for the university and from the university. Your Holiness, Mr. Ricard, Mr. Wangdu, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being with us this afternoon to continue this dialogue on aging and dying in peace. This second session will address more specifically the question of dying. For those who are joining us this afternoon, my name is Philippe Morillon, and I have the privilege to chair this session. As a very short summary, very short summary of this morning, I would like to stress the following. Society is made up of individual and individual minds, and individual minds form society. That may sound trivial, but it is not. It means that the group depends on individuals who form it, and this implicates a dual responsibility. On the one hand, in each individual is responsible for his or her development and his or her contribution to the group. But in symmetry, on the other hand, the whole group, the society, is responsible for providing the optimal conditions for individual to develop. So, they have to work together. Individual and society are profoundly intertwined, and if they do well, they will gain a lot. Another thing that was stressed, I think, very important for us this morning is, uh, is about education. Aging well means aging since the very beginning. The small kids who ask his grandfather whether or not is it good to grow old, the answer will be complicated. It's a lifetime education and learning. And the last point was about ethic. We have to be educated from early on. And ethic is an important issue in that uh, uh, sense. So ethic starts when we are small and is growing with us, and ethic could be taught in terms of a kind of universal ethic, at least for basic rules, that would be independent of religion or cultures. Diversity of cultures come on top of it. The two extremes of life are birth and death. We already succeeded in birth, at least in this room. The question is now, how can we succeed in death? To address this issue, I would like to introduce to you, Your Holiness, uh, the panelists of this afternoon. From your right side, Dr. Claudia Mazzocato, Palliative Care. Dr. Mazzocato is responsible for the section of Palliative Care of the University Hospital of Lausanne, the CHUV, and her research focuses on supportive care. Next to her and next to me, Dr. Jelena Martinovic, historian. 
Dr. Martinovich is a young PhD from the Department of History of the Faculty of Biology and Medicine, and her research focuses on near-death experience. Then on your left, the first is Professor Maya Burger, Indian Studies. Dr. Burger is professor at the Faculty of Art and Literature, and her research focuses on Indian culture. Next to Professor Burger is Professor Stephanie Clark, neuropsychologist. Professor Clark is professor, a professor at the Faculty of Biology, uh, Biology and at the SHUV, and her research focuses on brain percep perception of external stimuli, for instance, visual or sound. Last but not least, Professor Francesco Panese, social sciences. Dr. Panese is professor at the Faculty of Biology and Medicine of the university, and his research focuses on development of modern biomedicine and its relation to society. In the front of us, as this morning, we have additional scientists who prepared this dialogue and whose name appeared or will appear on the screen. So this is a little different setting than this morning, but not very different. So, is it okay? Kosta. Shall I? Thank you. Then it is my pleasure to hand you over to Professor Panez over there, who will shortly describe the current picture of dying people in our society and ask you about its uncertainties. Yes, thank you very much, Philippe. You are in I don't know what experience you have about hospital, but my question um, is related with dying uh, at the hospital. I don't know if you know, but in our small country, Switzerland, it's a really small country, in uh, 2011, uh, uh, 26,000 people died in the hospital. Only today, 70 people is dying in our hospital in Switzerland. And we know that in, uh, industri industrialized, sorry, in industrialized countries, uh, between uh, 50 and 70 people die today uh, uh, in medical institutions. And I would like to add that at the same time, this is, this is the numbers, uh, at, at the, at the same time, we could say that in our developed healthcare system, death is overlooked or even denied. So we have a first kind of paradox. Many people die at the hospital, but in our healthcare systems, death is denied. The death is not at the appropriate place at the hospital. And we could try to think about that, and maybe this is a consequence of uh, our medicine, our technical medicine, because we could uh, hypothesize, we could uh, say that in our medicine, the first problem is to, to prolong lifetime of the, of the body, of the bi biological body, and less to take care of the end of life of persons, of, of the patients. And you see again, something is a, like a tension, like a paradox. And uh, in this situation... And I would like to add that uh, in this situation, in our situation, it's difficult for doctors to avoid medical obstinacy because doctors medical try to, to save people. And sometimes this obstinacy uh, is linked or generates moral and physical suffering for the patient. And I think we are facing now two paradoxes. The first paradox is quite obvious. Today, the hospital, I, I, I told, it, I told uh, it to you, the hospital is the main place where people die today. And in the same time, 
Hospital is the least appropriate, uh, appropriate place to die. It's not a good place to die. <laughs> Uh, but, but a lot of people die, uh, are dying uh, at the hospital. And I think w th there is a second paradox. Uh, often, patients feel abandoned in the hospital at the end of life, in spite of the fact that medical efforts, medical doctors maintain them alive. They feel abandoned, and at the same time, medical doctors are helping them to stay alive. So you think this is the, the general situation in, in a few words. So uh, I would like uh, to ask you really a, a general question. Uh, what do you think about the fact that today the majority of people in our societies die at the hospital? Hmm. What do you think about uh, the majority of people today? Hmm? Actually, I think very good. Uh, although hospital is not the place to die, <laughs> but hospital is a suppose, I think, because of, because of prevent de death. So then, uh, the death take place in hospital means now there's because of end, any sort of possibility. possibility. So no regret. If you should die, uh, even, even your own home, there is some friend or the person, dying person himself or herself also may feel, oh, if I can get some treatment in hospital, I may live another week or month like that. So I think that's good. <laughs> so, so what is the problem? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but do I think uh, I think Kasoda, I think Kasoda, I think something because spoil. I think we, I think, uh, like in India, you see, large number of population. They're taking care by hospital, by medical sort of uh, some, uh, some medical people, not adequate. But you have plenty. Then, uh, still, then you see you feel some kind of frustration. That's I think. That's deep trouble. Deep trouble. Because you are, the facilities are too good. <laughs> but when people lack, then they're really eager to have help, mm -hmm. medical help, which they don't get. Mm -hmm. Well, you have all these facility. That is some people is that this question that I was right die in hospital. Right? May I put that another way, a little bit, little bit blunt? This is a silly question. <laughs> okay. Then, of course, I think you uh, usually the people, because an expert, a specialist in in certain field, then the specialist. You should take care of each individual. Mm. So some individual case is unhappy. So take that and then you should put big question. I think that's that can in Tan Chara. Come the member Madal Madala. So the Dhamma Yung. Corona Sanarava. There's cold atmosphere, home no matter family don't support them. Then yes, attitude by doctors and Nurses, that makes differences. I think all of you, I think, have sort of same experience. I also have the experience. Sometimes it's a big hospital. The machines, equipment, wonderful. But the person who really handled these doctors or nurses treated you like a machine, mm -hmm. taking care or repair work. One sort of, 
mechanic thing. Then here, no need affection or respect. If you, uh, if we, while it is repairing, uh, sometimes in the past, I also say, repair a watch. So when I repair a watch, no need respect. <laughs> no need affection, but simply uh, handle that. We human being, even animal, not like that. Uh, so we must sort of show human affection. No matter your sort of expertise, good, but without human feeling. Mm. Or then the patients, I also sometimes to say, doctor, without smile. And <laughs> take your hand <laughs> like that and put injection. <laughs> then sometimes you feel a little uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you see doctor or nurses really showing you real human feeling and some kind of expression of real concern of uh, the person's or a patient's health, like that. Then you feel, oh, now these people are really taking care of me. So we are uh, sort of living being who have the experience of feeling or pleasure, sort of because of the pain and pleasure in mental level, beside physical level, mental level. So therefore, uh, that is, I think, very, very important. I think that you can easily sort of uh, carry some kind of lesson uh, concerning the people of hospital. You see, occasionally, some kind of discussions. The not only profession, quality, but also the human sort of the affection of these uh, something very relevant, something very important. I often used to tell people uh, in Tibet, uh, you see, when I was there, you see, uh, some people say, oh, such, such physician. Uh, the, their knowledge is immense, very good, but their medicine, not very effective because that doctor's heart is not very good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but then, such such doctor, their sort of knowledge about medicine may not be so, so high, uh, uh, but very warm-hearted person. So their medicine is much more effective. I think to some extent, I think that's true. Mm. That's true. So they, I think, I think some kind of seminar and uh, some, as they invite some kind of psychologist, mm -hmm. psychotherapist. Uh, uh, this is some uh, who have some expertise about how to deal with human mind. Then some lecture, some discussion may be helpful. Again here, which we already talked, the secular ethics is very, very relevant, this field. Right. Every human action, whether become positive or negative, ultimately depends on that motivation, and that motivation very much led to the moral principle. Any motivation, any sort of the human activities carried with moral principle, then all movement, good, positive. If human activities is carried by uh, uh, negative what is it, sorry, motivation, harming, or careless, then difficult. Yes? Thank you. But do you think that to have a good heart is a natural condition? Because good. Because a good heart is natural. Jean Jean Good. Good heart. Yes. Because our life start uh, with, let's say, firstly, from mother's womb. Then, as soon as born, 
Bata's physical touch mm -hmm. is very, very essential, very important factor for proper development of child's brain. Uh, then, obviously, uh, next at least a few, uh, I think, uh, even I think a few years, the mother's affection is most important factor for proper development of the body and development of mind. That's very clear. As some doctor, some sort of scientist, because uh, of the carry experiment, monkey, young monkey, uh, some young monkey put with mother, some young monkey separated mm -hmm. from mother. Then watch that those young monkey with mother always playful, very happy mood, separated, ready to fight, always in bad mood. So we also same. So here, no differences, believer, non-believer, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, Easterner, Westerner, Northerner, Southerner, no differences. So any, anyone who appreciate others' affection, that, that automatically have potential to show affection to others. So that's the human nature. That's a biological factor. For our own survival, we need that. The last year, I, uh, I saw one article, one American scientist, uh, he mentioned those people who tell lies quite often, the stress is much higher. <laughs> it is quite logical. No, tell the truth, self-confidence, isn't it? No anxiety. The truth, we can always tell face to face, looking their eye, you can tell the truth. If you have some different sort of motivation, then you can, we can show smile, <laughs> but our eye cannot look directly a little bit. <laughs> so that automatically, you see, increase anxiety, right? stress, like that. So therefore, uh, uh, basically, human nature, I believe, human nature is more gentleness. And I think the children, I think they don't care about formality or these things. Whatever they feel, they express. They are very honest. That's a basic human nature. Uh, through education, our mind becoming more sophisticated, then the basic or uh, good quality, what you call dormant, dormant, sorry, uh, no further sort of because uh, of that, activated. Right? En en enhancement. Uh, so that's, I think, a mistake. Mm. Our education. Only take care brain development, neglect about warm-heartedness. And that part, when separate education institutions started, church take care of that. And family also take care, I think, to some extent. Now both fields, influence of church decline. Uh, and also family, uh, value also sometimes a little sort of neglect. And so, certainly with those with children's parent divorce uh, or worst thing, parent themselves abuse. Really terrible. So uh, then gradually it's such people, such such children, the basic good quality, then Kasore gradually become thinner, thinner, thinner. And then instead aggressiveness, suspicion, anger, frustration, 
these things now increasing. So that's why we are facing unnecessary problem. Actually, I always say, say uh, I believe seven million human beings, no one wants problem. Isn't it? No one wants trouble. But ultimately, we ourselves become troublemaker. Why? <laughs> so, due to lack of holistic, due to lack of sort of what's the long term interest, we not taking fully about the ability of our sort of brain look reality, holistic, because too much emotion. Once emotion develops, our view becomes biased. Then we can't see the reality. Just short sight, because short sighted way, short short term short interest term. like that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think at the beginning you said something very important for Western society. The hospital is not a place to die, it is a place to help. That that is sounds trivial, it is not again, because uh, we have transformed hospital in place to die sometimes. We have another question uh, that, uh, that is important in our society is that is we do not know, doctors may know, some people know, but we do not know how to talk about death to a person that is going to die because we are afraid to say that. And this goes further. Sometimes people are so much in the hospital, so much alone, so depressed that they sometimes ask to die to nurses and uh, doctors and they ask assistants to die. That, that should not be the role, as I understand. But this is a very controversial issue, and I would like to uh, turn on to uh, Dr. Matsukato to address this important point. Thank you, Philippe. Um, you are nice. Um, thank you very much for all. Uh, for my question, it's a difficult question, an uh, ethical question. Uh, with medical advance, um, we are living longer but also are experiencing more and longer physical and mental suffering and social isolation. In the past, um, death occurred suddenly for the majority, but now for us, the death uh, is an anticipated event. And uh, in your modern country, um, some patients, some uh, incredibly ill patients or older persons ask their doctor to be euthanized or to be assisted in their suicide. And it's not clear. We have some studies, the first studies suggest that the main reason for the wish to astonish death are depression, but also our despair because of existential, uh, spiritual distress, because of loss of meaning in the life, uh, because of loss of uh, autonomy too. And uh, another important reason, and it's a big preoccupation for me now, is an increasing feeling to be a burden for the family, but to the society now. And physical symptoms such as pain are rarely decisive factors. So how we can help better this person? What would you say to an older person or an incurably ill person who asks to be euthanized or assisted in this who her suicide? What you do if someone you know would express this wish? Hmm? Order or an inc incurability, incurability in person who asked to me. That's it. That's it. That's it. Shime. Shime, my way. Or assist in his or her. Suicide. Uh, I think 
You see, we have to uh, further sort of uh, analyze or study that, that person's sort of wish to die. Well, what's the reasons? Mm. Is the reason a sound basis? Then, then okay. Uh, for example, you see the uh, quite expensive using this mission, uh, no hope to fully recover, simply keep your body alive, but basically now already now dying, already dying like that. And then the Kasachavati expenses the family member also, you see, then find difficulties. And at least, you see, in any case, no hope for survive, but only create more trouble. With that circumstances, if the person want to die, I think, Kasota. Uh, so that's, I think, exceptional case. But otherwise, uh, we, uh, just due to sort of because of frust, because of the impatience, sometimes it happens. Then we should not let you see, die. They try to reduce their impatience and give them hope. Uh, and I think to, for recover, the patient's will is very essential. So give them hope and sort of confidence they can overcome these sufferings. I think that's best. So all this, we have to see, examine case to case. So that's very important. That's my view. Thank you. Uh, another question for the physician now. <laughs> uh, in Switzerland, in Switzerland, um, to assist a patient uh, or an older person to his or her suicide is possible. Uh, but for certain doctors who are trained to cure illness or to relieve uh, suffering, uh, these requests are very painful human experience and ethical dilemmas because they can contradict their personal and professional values. And what advice would you give to a physician who is confronted with a request of euthanasia or assisted suicide? Dr. Koronja, that patient Koronja, she gave me a letter. That Dr. Koronja, she gave me a letter. 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 Ethical decision, pe kalle ka vore se kono se kile lo jong chasang la tang galwa da ho shira. Adi kono se shita kalle dos. Adi des si si men trial. Zhe zhong zhao zhao zhen de de ba pen de ne se di yin shi jian. Ba pen zhao zhao ge pen bu de zhen de ya da so su guo ba. Da guo ren ne zhi chi la bu zhi ga la shi ni pen le ne che yu na. So it's all based on the use of compassion, because to and evaluate compassion and wisdom. To, uh, wisdom to evaluate the balance between harm and help. If it harms more, to refuse a particular intervention. Now I think here you see we we have to make a distinction: uh, harm and benefit, immediate, long term. Uh, the long term. Harmful, we must avoid. But long term benefit, short term harmful, then we have to uh, commit harmful mm -hmm. for sake of long term benefit. So that's uh, animal cannot do, only we human being. Mm -hmm. Study the reality, uh, analyze, then we should keep our long term interest. Uh, then sometimes we have to sacrifice. Now here, the, as I already mentioned, alive that person, more trouble, more suffering to more people. Uh, 
mm. in order to reduce that one person's life and worthwhile. So that I think that reason go further, further, further than those old people <laughs> who simply create more burden to the rest of the family or society even than or, or one my sort of friend, one Cuba, Cuban refugee who settled in America. Very religious minded. Uh, uh, I think two years ago, uh, so when we met, they told me they often pray to God, bring uh, the casa Fidel Castro to heaven as soon as better. <laughs> <laughs> so very nice. <laughs> he don't like Fidel Castro sort of oppressive sort of regime. But not bad motivation. Yeah. Please bring to heaven. <laughs> Pray to God. <laughs> so that's wow. mutual benefit. To him also benefit. <laughs> and the rest of the sort of uh, people who suffer under, under his sort of regime also some benefit. <laughs> like that, we have to we have to judge right? case to case and like that. And long term interest, short term interest. Thank you. Right, so, but it is indeed a, a, very, a very critical issue in medicine because most medical doctors, nurses, staff are... I, I think I may put this one sort of example in Buddhist sort of practice. If someone, I mean, still is completely prohibited, but someone, you see, there's certain things which essentially may sort of bring risk of that person's life or too much attachment and due to that create more problem. Then out of genuine sense of concern of their well-being still that is permissible. Not out of your own greed or your own use. Yes, uh, for instance, if someone is using an object in a very harmful way, out of strong grasping, or I don't know which particular case, it could be drugs or something, and then, you know, in Buddhist ethics, to, to take what is not given is the definition of stealing, and is considered to be a negative action. But if it's ultimately for the long-term benefit of that person, then it becomes virtuous because it actually benefits the person. So ethics has to be contextual and embedded in real life situations. So case to case, basically, because that relates with motivation and the interest for larger, yeah. uh, larger good. Uh, uh, for the greater good, oh, like we that. have to see for short term, long term, one person, many person. Yes, thank you. So we have a lot of debate in Switzerland around that. Some people, some organization allow this kind of organized but assisted facilitation of death, some do not. Uh, it is a discussion in the medical uh, in the medical ethics because it's a question of ethics, and as you said, it has to be discussed for each particular case. Um, so we need here humility. We need also the persons and the family to be prepared for this event. I guess you cannot go and just snatch the hose like that and uh, say I did the job. So everybody should be aware of what is going on. So you have to prepare for, for death. And as this morning session, you mentioned very clearly, you have to prepare your life for aging, but also for death. I'm from Occidental culture, and I'm not sure I can do this well, at least not yet. Uh, but the question is crucial, how to prepare death, if we can. And I would like to hand over now uh, the microphone to Dr. Jelena Martinovic, 
who uh, addressed this type of question in her recent doctoral dissertation um, on uh, near-death experiences. Absolutely. Okay. Oh. Yes. Your Holiness. I'm interested in reports on experiences close to death. These uh, experiences are known in Western societies at least since antiquity, but they have gained an interest uh, since the 1960s and 70s. We are all familiar with uh, the near-death experience. However, I do not want to follow here the usual debate, which wants to know whether these experiences can prove the survival of the soul after bodily death, or if they can be studied scientifically. I simply consider these experiences as an example of how human beings deal with death. So, in the Western societies, we have a vast amount of descriptions coming from survivors, such as rescued climbers, uh, rescued nearly drowned persons, or successfully reanimated patients. And they claim that uh, the near-death experience has beneficial effects. They uh, fear less death afterwards, and they embrace more fully life. So one particular example we have in uh, the Western tradition is um, Michel de Montaigne, the French philosopher from the 17th century. Um, he, after having had a horse accident, he actually started to, and during this accident he believed to die, um, he started afterwards to write his considerations on death. And in this essay, he says that everybody should be able to contemplate and to imagine his own death every day so as to be able to be prepared to death. So coming back to um, nowadays, we can observe, at least in Western cultures, that there is a preference to die suddenly in order to avoid suffering. But at the same time, we have seen with just these recent examples, that there are many terminal ill patients who have sometimes difficulties not knowing how to apprehend death or face death. So, Your Holiness, I feel free to ask you, is it essential to train ourselves to experience death? And if yes, how could we do that? Hmm. Obviously, uh, I think even some difficult today uh, event, uh, uh, without any sort of preparation, mentally, at least mentally, prepare that when that event comes across, you may get shocked or completely demoralized or lost hope. If you prepare that with knowing or oh, very possible that awful event may come. So if that come, oh, how can, how, how I should face that, some kind of mentally prepare, then exclusive event happen, much better to handle. So any sort of, the, of the event. So therefore, the death, uh, right from the beginning, it makes us familiar with understanding. Sooner or later, that will come. That is part of our life. Uh, so, uh, such person mentally, someone will prepare. So, actually, that come. Right? Yes, now that come. Okay. Those people even avoid the very word of old age or kasajyoti, death. Then, when they really, is it come the time of death, then really, kasajyoti, uh, very unhappy. Unsettled. Ka. Unsettled. Oh, very, very unhappy. So it is naturally, you see, familiarize. Firstly, accept that is part of our life. Then, 
uh, familiarize. Now some of our sort of practice, uh, the death process. Every day we visualize these things. So to such sort of as the practitioner, when death comes, I think uh, much easier. So we say that according to the level of spiritual preparation that applies to practitioners who have taught and meditated upon impermanence and death, in the best case, they are so prepared that they welcome with sort of ease and almost joy, I mean, like meeting a friend. In the middle case, at least without fear. And in the worst case, at least without regret. Mm -hmm. So that reflects uh, becoming, having familiar with that process as part of life. So I think those traditions uh, uh, have because of the concept of life after life. Then death is simply like change body. You still remain continuously, life after life. Uh, then I think one genuine faithful Christian when death come, if you, in both case the person lead this morning, I, we already mentioned the meaningful carried meaningful life. Uh, then, at the time of death come, no reason feel regret, and the person who believe God as a creator, then God creates now your death. Because of that. You created you and uh, your life. So your life now, uh, God created uh, such a way, now time of your death come. Then believe God. Then at least uh, some period, complete rest in coffin. <laughs> then wait, final judgment. So it's a firm sort of belief. God is imin as of the, as of the infinite love, merciful. God never create bad things. So single point of faith. And then uh, no reason to feel to feel sort of fear or some some sadness. So God planned that way. That was very powerful. Then non believer uh, should accept the reality, now that come. Although, uh, better live another so the few more years, but now that come is a fact. Now you have, to, also you have to accept that. One Buddhist scholar in the 8th century, the uh, Shantideva, you see, he mentioned, he expressed, when some tragedy uh, happened, that, or about to happen, analyze the tragedy. If the tragedy is such, uh, you can overcome that, then instead of frustration or sadness, uh, work hard to overcome that. If the situation is such, no possibility to overcome, then no use, too much worry. Except, I think that's a very realistic sort of approach. So non-believer, I think you should think that way. Yes, that come, sad. But now, it, it was the definite well, die. Then, so again, you see these things, at, the, at that moment, you see difficult to, so to get some kind of inner strength. 
they depend on whole your life. Your life, they utilize some useful, mainly not making money, not making sort of enemy, <laughs> but making some benefit to, to others. Then at the end, no feel of regret. I use my life properly. Then that come. I said, no, no fear, no, no regret, no regret, like that. So that also is the one reason. Sooner or later we have to die. Therefore, uh, at, the, at the time of death, uh, you, should, you should not have any sort of feeling of regret. So therefore, your life must spend proper way. That means, if possible, serve others. If not, Rest in humming other. <laughs> so, as a non initiated uh, Buddhist, um, if I ask for a simple exercise, would it be, for example, to train myself or ourselves in the idea of annihilation? My, I, will, I won't be here anymore, or is it better to think of to fill my life before dying. So do I have, there are some people saying, therapists, that you need to train yourself in your ego side, like you do your own suicide in order to experiment that one day you are not here anymore. So what is your opinion about um, uh, less or more? <laughs> Again, I think uh, complicated. Uh, uh, it depends on one's own sort of kasoda, knowledge and ability. I think simple thing. Try to develop uh, ability uh, during dream time, dreaming. Uh, so without training, so it's just some, sometimes we, we, we develop sort of awareness. Now I am dream state. I am dreaming. Lucid dream. Ah. Lucid dream. Oh. Uh, so that, I think, the first step. Then once you have the ability when dreaming, now I am in state of dream. Then you say, try to control dream. Uh, then, you see some meditation, that dream state. Then you get, you get the deeper experience, the dissolution of elements, grosser level of elements. So that's similarity, some similarity at the time of death, dissolution, step by step. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> lifetime, li lifetime learning, really. And uh, I think a lot of uh, unknown in, quantita in quantitative sciences, at least. But I'll, I'll try to remain naive and ask go in, with the following. After my own death, there will hopefully be survivors, friends, relatives, family. And uh, how do they have to prepare for my death? And how do they have to go through my death and uh, after my death? I would like uh, Professor Maya Burger from Indian Studies to address this issue. Your Holiness, um, I would like to speak a bit with you about death and rituals. An important medium to experience and express symbols are rituals. So we observe that in our societies there are less and less religious rituals. But there is one exception, and namely the rituals at the time of death. Um, we have two types of rituals. One which accompanies the dying person 
and claims to assure his well-being in the world beyond. And then, of course, we have those rituals which claim to help the survivors to cope with loss and grief. Now, there's a new phenomenon, which maybe you don't know in our Western societies, where more and more people invent rituals at the time of death, very spontaneously and creatively. And these uh, rituals can take various forms. It can be uh, on the internet, it can be in ecological cemeteries, there are many, many uh, ways. And they invite us to reflect on their purpose and efficiency. I think it's very interesting to reflect on this period of death and why rituals at this very moment are so important. And I would like to ask you uh, the following question. While facing death, is it necessary to use traditional rituals like we know them in all religious traditions? Or can it also be helpful to invent new rituals? Basically, I'm skeptical about rituals. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ritual uh, with, I think, deeper understanding and deeper experience, then good. Without sort of experience or understanding, that just you see, carry some sort of the prayer and some offering, I don't think much help. So that's. Uh, so then, what kind of ritual? But you see if people spontaneously invent rituals, like for instance, they have made observations when uh, the body remains longer at home, there's a possibility to have the person, the dead person, for some days at home. Children, adults, family, they invent new kinds of rituals very spontaneously. Don't you think this can be a way of, uh, of, of having a very deep or new relation with the dead person? Again, I don't know. Uh, I think, again, you see, much depends on case to case. Right? Uh, some people may get some benefit, then okay. But basically, I don't believe such sort of ritual. And they, do they, and a ritual carried by other people, I think very little effect to that, to that person. Uh, <laughs> the, the real thing, the person, the dying person, while he or she alive, uh, think more seriously about death. Uh, and at least, you see, carry some sort of the meaningful life. That is much more important. Otherwise, uh, after that... So may I we, ask you a personal uh, question? Yes. Do you yourself practice some rituals to prepare your death? Not a ritual, but simply, you see, the training our mind. Training uh, And the visualization of, you see, generally speaking, uh, eight different stages of dissolution. The body element, uh, solid, liquid, and heat, energy, then consciousness. Consciousness also, grosser level of consciousness, more subtle, very subtle. So altogether, eight because of the stages. Stages of dying. Of, of dissolution. Dissolution. Uh, yeah. sort of element, body element. 
from grosser level, it's more subtler, 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 subtle like that. So that I, oh, every day, I think uh, uh, four or five times, a compulsory, this is the visualization, these things. Suppose sort of preparing my death, but I do not know when actual death come. I really, you see, they <laughs> practice these things or not, that still do not know, no guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> so, here you see, I think uh, this morning or lunchtime, I, I think I mentioned, there are cases, a person after death, body still remain fresh. Some cases, at the time of death, body, because of long illness or old age, very weak, but after sort of stop breathing, uh, the brain activity stop, the body becoming more fresh. Uh, more because of that. Uh, glowing or some kind of... Glowing, glowing. Yeah. So through that way, uh, sometimes it remains a uh, few days, sometimes a few weeks. It happened. Last, uh, I think, uh, last over 50 years, as far as we notice, I think at least uh, 30, 30 or 40 uh, cases. Uh, so such cases there. My own tutor, the 13 days after his death, the medical doctor checked his body, then declared death, 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 but body remained fresh. Uh, I think two years ago, one practitioner dead in New Zealand. So he, he uh, or fortunate or unfortunate, his death place in uh, take place in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so the the custom, the dead body, uh, has to remove from hospital. Mm. So then, the, his sort of. Oh, it's the friend. Uh, they noticed you see, his body remained very fresh, and I think remained like this. So, so they asked some kind of permission from the hospital authority. Then doctor come check. Yes, he dead, but his body no danger of smell or this decaying. Therefore, the authority of the hospital say, okay, you can give. Now, this case, one very strange thing. Uh, after four days, uh, see, his sort of hand, I think, remained like that. Then, fourth night, uh, his sort of hand, I said, the, I, th I, think, I think the, the left hand is a tightly sort of con control, way, control of the, the, the hold. I said, this finger of uh, the other hand. Very strong, very strongly. So at that time I, I mentioned, oh, how pity. You should keep video 24 hours. Then how the movement is to come. So actually it happened. So I think about 10 days, as the body remained fresh. Then another uh, very good uh, I said, the Lama, you see, I think 18 days remain fresh. So now, the, the modern scientist, you see, Kasoda uh, is something unusual. Unusual. Uh, unusual. Mm -hmm. No explanation. Now, only explanation is the different level of consciousness grosser level of element of consciousness stop. So brain activity stop. So brain is basis of grosser level of consciousness. 
but more subtle and subtle, innermost of subtle consciousness, still there. So as soon as that subtle consciousness depart from this body, then immediately decay body. Now here, quite a sort of strange sort of today, a story. Last year, uh, one Tibetan Lama, who historically uh, the uh, the top most important Lama of Mongolia, uh, one way, uh, you see, uh, he uh, most because the highest sort of Lama in Mongolia, but while uh, his physical okay. The, the Mongolian government never permit his visit there or uh, not permit remit there. When Mongolian government give permission and his body or then becoming very, 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 very fragile, cannot talk much. <laughs> so, uh, consider a very highly sort of spiritual, highest spiritual leader, but go like that way. But now his death, I think the 19, 19, so so in any way, uh, end of Tibetan calendar sort of year, the previous end of the year, he telephoned me uh, uh, where he should die, when he should die. <laughs> then <laughs> I respond to him, you should not die this moment. That's the end of, uh, end of the year, Tibetan calendar. So not good. So next, <laughs> beginning of next year. Hmm? <laughs> and the place you should die in Mongolia. <laughs> Then you see his death exactly according to my sort of the wish or my or the <laughs> idea. Oh. In spite, in spite of his physical very, very weak, he alive till I think New Year's, I think eight, eight day or something like that. Then the, uh, that day he died. I received a message from Mongolia, now he died but his body remained fresh. Then I immediately uh, tried to send my other emissary with one scarf. And uh, not easy to reach Mongolia from India to Korea, Korea to Mongolia. So long flight, several hours. Uh, so then they asked me, uh, it seems as if he remained, let's say, that, 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 that state. Uh, uh, then, I, uh, then I told them, told them till my emissary reached there, you don't disturb. Mm. Then I think the uh, fourth day or fifth day, some uh, liquid come from his nose. Then they asked me, now, that the indication of beginning of decaying. Uh, so they asked me what to do. Then I still, so I told them, oh, okay, doesn't matter, keep, must keep. Then that same day, uh, evening, my emissary reached there. And as soon as the scarf which I sent, you see, put on the dead body, then immediately, I said, they cause of decay. So, looks quite strange. His death in Mongolia controlled from India. <laughs> quite strange phenomena, these things. <laughs> so these are mysterious things. In any way, you see, unless uh, you have some idea, the different level of consciousness, mm -hmm. very difficult to explain these things and some kind of connection, mysterious levels. Like that. 
when, when I die, who will control me? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So, Your Holiness, I noticed one thing: you are skepti skeptical about rituals, oh. and s skeptical or skepticism yes. is a feature of scientists. Yes. So we rejoined us really on the skepticism issue. The, the what you just are alluding to, death, definition of death, and the moment of death is actually a topic which is the expertise of Professor Stephanie Clark, neuropsychologist, and uh, she will take about the power of medicine or the symbolic power of medicine in deciding death. Well, thank you. I would like to come back to the issue you, have, you were quoting about the exper experience in New Zealand. Developments in, in our society require a precise definition of the moment of death. Uh, death is defined as the irreversible failure of vital organs. Uh, breathing ceases, the heart stops beating, and for centuries this has been taken as the moment of death. Mm. However, with the advances of medical care, this definition is no longer sufficient. Cardiac and pulmonary function can be sustained beyond the moment when normally death could occur. Uh, um, brain death is. Mm. We no longer can rely on. Um, cardiopulmonary arrest mm -hmm. as a sign of death. The decisive feature of dying is the definite irreversible failure of brain functions. Um, medically, it, is, it can be defined as a patient in a coma who can no longer breathe. There are specific signs in respect to eye movements. There are specific reflexes which are no longer present. Brain death is followed by the inevitable death of other organs, um, of tissues and of cells. The definition of uh, death as irreversible brain failure is necessary for medical practice. It, is, it has also a great impact on society and on ethics. It defines the moment when life-prolonging uh, measures can be stopped. This definition facilitates uh, enormously uh, organ transplantation for non-living donors. On the downside, it could be interpreted or perceived uh, as uh, reducing a person to the function of his brain. And we wanted to ask your comments on, this, this, uh, on these different definitions of the moment of death. <laughs> According to this particular concept, subtle level of consciousness, then the, as they stop the heart beating, then Within a short period, the blood circulation ceases and brain, then brain dead. But the body still remains fresh. And this person is who remains in that state. The brain no longer working. Blood circulation no longer there. Heart beating, of course, not there. Uh, so we uh, uh, so we, we, we say that's dying moment, not death. The real death, the subtle mind depart from the body and body become decay. Then that's death. Thank you. Then the person you, you um, explained in, was in New Zealand who died, I mean, there was, he was brain dead. But then, for several days, the body remained normal. This person, throughout all these days, would be dead then. So, dying, dying moment. Yeah. But that's why, you see, I 
sort of expressed by sort of because of the pitch it was camera must sort of there no yeah. right then we the uh, we ourselves you see difficult to explain mm-hmm. yeah. all sort of energy stop cease but hand movement take place okay. so how how it happened we ourselves confused not adequate explanation so we have to sort of work uh, with help of sort of scientific research work and our own sort of explanation that's rather so because of the new phenomena some scientists now actually is showing interest uh, to carry sort of uh, investigation uh, so oh, now here uh, little so little, little cause of the uh, strange survey uh, you see uh, in i think at least maybe i think 10 years some equipment is uh, left damsala uh, with some trained person or at least you see how to handle this equipment so in the early, uh, early period uh, that equipment not permanently remained there so uh, some occasion a person after that this is that kind of experience you see happen at that time uh, no available about equipment when equipment available not die <laughs> <laughs> so meantime i cannot request practitioner please die <laughs> in in order to kasa in order to kasa carry our experiment <laughs> that also not very sure if out of my request may die but fail to meditate that that, that, that really disaster <laughs> <laughs> then later uh, now you see that equipment i think last now i think uh, three four years now uh, that equipment not permanently remained there and also you see trained few people to handle now so then one uh, i mentioned the very high lama good top scholar and meantime good practitioner and he actually they uh, become because of the highest the position of yellow head sect gelug of kanjichiba or so of the of yes of the of the gelupa school tradition he was the head about oh so as soon as i heard from south india uh, after his death his body remained fresh and then i immediately asked the concerned was the uh, was a clinic where this equipment and trained person there then they immediately sent the person and equipment then you should put all wire on uh, that dead body's head and close touch with scientist in america mm. so of course as a scientific sort of research just one case you cannot finalize uh, same sort of experiment and different or say more more cases then you can say so uh, uh, but there is some scientist who involved in that uh, once told me that after a few days after death and very short moment one electric sort of radius because of the movement signal a signal in the dead body's head after a few days dead so that's very unusual they say very unusual no scientific explanation uh, so now we need is a further sort of investigation i think at this time this time i cuz i left cuz it's a very eight right down to 
eight this month I left. So uh, the, I think two days, two days before that, I received one sort of message from Tibet. One monk whose age, uh, I know that monk before 1959, I know. Isn't that monk age uh, 88 after his death? Uh, he remained. So that was the position mm -hmm. without decaying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 11 days or something like that. Quite old. Then similarly, another one, another monk, uh, the same period, I received message from Tibet, the 98-year-old monk. Uh, again, it's after that, the body remained fresh. Uh, next few days, I heard yes, these, these things will happen. So now further, uh, the investigation with full cooperation with scientists and uh, the person who, saw, who knows some, something about this explanation. The, with full cooperation, you see, uh, the further sort of investigation is very, very useful, very useful like that. Um, may, yes. I, may I ask you, how do you consider these events? Are they um, part of the, well, some outliers in normal type of dying, or are these very special intervention at a spiritual level? I think normal people also, you see, sometimes uh, uh, could happen, could happen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But then certainly, uh, some experience to people much more easier. Okay. But that also now, now the question is, during uh, dissolution, mm -hmm. all gross level of consciousness, the ordinary, the uh, cognitive power, where you should be new, Cognitive power, Cognitive power uh, yes. gradually reduce. Mm. So trained person, uh, uh, the grosser level of consciousness dissolving, mm. but cognitive power remain. Okay. Then uh, the, at that level of very very subtle level of consciousness, then uh, carry uh, that consciousness become kasota. Uh, I mean, meditation, mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, unless you really train several years, are difficult. Okay. Yeah. Some my friend, some American, yeah. actually, as a result of the last uh, 40 years, uh, 30, 40 years sort of practice, some sort of ability, uh, the concentration, you see, meditate on, one while meditate, the gross, begin because uh, of dissolution. The, so then, you see, that person, you see, can remain in meditation, sort of, because of the meditation, sort of, because of the state, three, four hours single-pointed sort of meditation with sort of experience of dissolution. Quite strange, these things. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Is this compatible with organ donation? Because organ donation. I did one book about the Chimba on Ning to Nepal trail. I think uh, of course, that that person dying, that that, that person, you see, before he di he died, right? Before his sort of stay, mm. his his consciousness clear. Then 
according to his or her sort of will. Wish. And then, okay, very good, mm. donate. Some people, uh, uh, some my friend, among my friend, you see, they are really very much willing to give donation, because donate their eye. So far, I never met a person who really offer both eye donate, <laughs> at least one eye <laughs> and one kidney. <laughs> that uh, number of cases is happening. Then after that, of course, is Hosoda, Hosoda, that's all. Shinji Shibrita, that deep hand of Jun, Yakutaro. So once we, we are dead anyway, if we can do something further beneficial to others, well, that's perfect. Oh. One, one great sort of dependence of Lama, I think, in, uh, in I think, early part of this century, the, the, during the century, after he died, usually you see people, uh, sometimes you see keep body, sorry. Mordon. 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 They kind of mummified, the, they preserved the body mm. for a long time. Or sometimes, most cases, they burnt. So that Lama uh, advised or suggested his sort of follower, his sort of friend. My body must give, my dead body must give to vulture. At least some vulture gets some benefit. <laughs> At least fulfill stomach. <laughs> like that. Very good. Just burn. It's wasted. <laughs> so that dead body, uh, all the dead lamas, I know his picture. And when I was young, I know I met him. Very good one. Very good scholar. And very good practitioner. But his physical, rather thin. So vulture <laughs> may not <laughs> enjoy much. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, we, you discussed this issue of organ donation or giving its corpse so that it remains for the future, whether it is a vulture or something else. Um, that, that brings me to the next question. In medicine, modern science, medicine and modern science do not like to discuss very much of dying. They want people to live, they want to give care, and mm. they want to prolong life. There is an abyssal question here because they cannot avoid death at the end. So, how to play with that and what is pertinent or not pertinent. I would like uh, Dr. Kaufman from the, from the front seat here to address this question to you. Your Holiness, as we have seen, rituals are a means to cope with uh, the loss of human beings. But in the modern Western world, it seems we seem to observe a growing refusal of accepting the limits, be they uh, intellectual or be they physical, and it can go as far as refusing death or denying death. What we observe with the development of technologies and the progress of medicine and biology, um, this refusal can go as far as the denial of mortality. So we begin to speak about something like a mortality. Some researchers, for example, forecast that it will be possible to achieve a continuous repair of the human body, to reach immortality or immortality, or even to transfer the content of the brain into a computer. <laughs> so, uh, the question we would like to ask you is the following. What do you think of the tendency in Western society, using science and technology, to push away or even refuse the limits of aging and death. If you can, most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I want to add something. 
uh, I often used to sometimes say telling people, used to some, uh, what's it, mischievous people, uh, their brain, the part of their brain, or part of human brain, usually is a common sense develop. So some of these, what's it, uh, mischievous people, that part of brain is missing. So through technology, put that part of <laughs> brain in their mind, then common sense develop. That's very good. Now, similarly here, uh, the, the part of brain which develop too much emotion, anger, hatred, fear, uh, remove that <laughs> and put uh, the, the source of sort of compassion, forgiveness, put. Then, I think, uh, with help of technology, I think a new breed of humanity, <laughs> compassionate humanity, without much effort, let because technicians do that. Oper uh, the surgeons, the surgeons yes. let surgeons do that. Then I also, you see, most welcome, without my own effort. Oh, uh, show, please, take, 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 take here. <laughs> I think, again, yeah, this is a question. Uh, you see the because immortal way, Mashiva. Mashiva, she Immortal. And you see, life really meaningful, compassionate. Oh, then very good. But if you see too much emotion, like present hours of experience, continue, then I think some cases, as the Cuban sort of believer, you see, they pray, I think, better to limit <laughs> those troublemakers, I think, remain forever, it's more trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, so I don't know, this I, th I think difficult, difficult. Just at lunchtime, I mentioned the, uh, uh, so the science and technology, theoretically speaking, if they create certain sort of synthesized matter which can, uh, can act basis of consciousness. Then, uh, you see new life, new sentient being can develop. Our own case, right from the beginning, not like this body, not like this brain, very tiny sort of jellyfish. And that also is a go further without consciousness, just particle. Then gradually, uh, through evolution, reach certain level, the combination of these sort of particle uh, become sort of kasoda. Complex, ka complex, uh, complex to to kasoda, uh, to, to 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 become basis of consciousness. Then sentient beings start. So the brain substance, because uh, through evolution, you see change. Now, last, I think, because uh, I think a few, few hundred thousands, I think a few hundred thousand, this presence of brain develop. And another, I think, after one million, maybe it's a different shape of brain, then different maybe different sort of emotions. So long this sort of, because of the, uh, the brain, this level remain. I often say telling people, the rituals and these things are more or less just a cultural aspect. Time change, lifestyle change, this will change, not important. But real sort of so the training of our mind, which tackle our emotion. That part, today's modern human beings, the emotion, and 2,500 uh, years ago, is it a human being uh, on, at that time, at least in India, I think same emotion, same type of emotion. So the method which mentioned at that time, still relevant. Uh, after a uh, few hundred thousand, perhaps one million, then maybe different. Yes, next question. 
so we are reaching science fiction and um, and the mind. We, we talked together at noon about the power of computer and whether or not they might once have a mind, and you said no. <laughs> um, I think the role of science is important, and I wonder if a student has a question about the role of science. Um, yes? Your Holiness, um, I am studying psychology as well as Indian studies, and I would like to know, um, I would like to ask you, what, in your opinion, should we expect from science? Arfa. What field? should we expect from science? What are the expectations that we could have? Uh, from science in general? Uh -huh. From science on, on this field regarding uh, aging and, oh. and dying? Mm. Mm. Science is a lot of expectations. I think further research is very necessary. I think the best way to use human intelligence, analyze, investigation, two ways, through logical process, or investigate on mental level. Another one, mind and mission combinedly carry investigation. So, the investigation is very, very essential. Very essential. I think as far as Buddhism is concerned. Now, of course, I know better about Buddhism. <laughs> so, uh, so, sometimes I express the Buddhist sort of, sort of concept. But this n never sort of meant, I I'm sort of indicate, Buddhism is because of most profound religion. I never said that. Uh, uh, so the each different people or uh, different faith there. It suits the, the local people because it happened a thousand years. So like that. So a new religion uh, may not be sort of suitable. Uh, however, now uh, Buddha stated, I think that's quite unique. Buddha stated, Oh, my follower, monks, nuns, uh, scholars should not accept my teaching out of faith, out of devotion, but rather through investigation, experiment. So that's why, you see, I start a dialogue with modern scientists about 40 years ago. Uh, when I first sort of developed my sort of desire to say the uh, uh, or to dialogue or to interact with modern sci scientists, I just expressed say, that my desire to some people. Then one American lady who married with one Tibetan, uh, suppose she also followed Tibetan Buddhism. So then she told me. She responded to me, oh, be careful. Science is killer of religious faith. Then I thought, thought again and again. Buddha stated, uh, should not follow out of faith, out of devotion, but rather investigation. Thorough investigation and experiment. Now science as a method to carry experiment and investigation. So therefore, I felt, see, no contradiction, scientific way of research or analyze, and Buddhist way of analyze. It's a method different. Buddhists mainly use logic, logic. So experiment, laboratory, our own head. Uh, science, huge laboratory, <laughs> missions. <laughs> and so far, modern science mainly focusing matters uh, which have 
So which has to which have sorosity, physical. So you can measure. Uh, even light, very subtle sort of cosmic particle, so you can measure. Consciousness, you cannot uh, take measurement, mm-hmm. difficult. So, so therefore, up to now, I think up to uh, late 20th century, you see, mind, these are not sort of scientific, are a field of scientific research, something different. Now, later part of 20th century and beginning of this 21st century, now number of medical scientists or brain scientists now really showing interest, uh, exploring or study nature of mind or emotion. It's directly affects our health and the health of the society or family. Because health or what? Because of healthy society, healthy family. So therefore, now, more sort of experiment carried by scientists. So we really now full cooperation. So really wonderful. Investigation is the, I think, because of that, the me, namju, the me, chaju chikdi namju Namju Pesuchasti, investigation shadri, and scientific investigation payoff. So the the special characteristic of human beings is precisely this very, very high in faculty of intelligence. So what is the main use of that faculty is precisely to investigate properly whatever we need to know better. So it is really wonderful. Since my childhood, I have keen interest about technology and about science. Then, uh, last now 30, 40 years, actually I had opportunity to discuss with scientists mainly four fields, cosmology, like Big Bang theory, these things, so Buddhist literature also mentioned these things. World come, disappear. whole galaxies, whole universe comes, it disappear, come, disappear, like that. Uh, on the basis of the work of, of five elements. Joanga. Five elements, yes. Uh, or external matter, four elements, like that. So therefore, uh, uh, cosmology is something common subject. Then, uh, neurobiology, also common subject. A lot of explanation about so this neuro, so the veins and ch- we call chakras, these things. Mm. Uh, so, the details of the, of the explanation about brain, uh, not much. So, modern sort of uh, scientific sort of, because of the, uh, explanation about brain, neuron, Neuron, these things are really wonderful, very helpful to learn from modern scientists. Then physics, quantum physics. One of my Indian friend, uh, nuclear physicist, you see, he found concept of quantum physics. Some some of Nagarjuna's sort of writing. That's 2,000 years ago. They already mentioned the quantum physics already, the concept of quantum physics already there. So he told me, he really uh, sort of caused a surprise. Uh, quantum physics, that, that concept already found in India 2,000 years ago. So when we discuss about quantum physics, then the Buddhist authority, they, uh, concept, particularly mathematical philosophical sort of concept, very similar. Right. Very similar. Uh, then, then of course, the, the physics, very subtle, subtle level, mm-hmm. Buddhist literature also mentioned about particles. 
but modern scientific sort of explanation is more precise, more subtle. So here also, you see, immense help to learn from scientific finding. Then psychology. As psychology is concerned, the ancient Indian psychology, including Buddhist psychology, is highly developed. Compare that, modern psychology is like baby psychology. <laughs> really, really be like that. Uh, the very term, very limited, Maria. Shiva Kolamna, very few words. In Sanskrit and Tibetan, so the precise of Hosuna. Classification. Uh, uh, detailed classification. Detailed detail classification. Yeah. So many scientists in that field, they really very much appreciate and they're really showing genuine interest is it to learn more information about that. So combination in four fields, immense sort of mutual benefit like that. Thank you very much. I would like to add something to that because of course I fully agree. Um, I was asked at uh, the recess by journalists whether or not science could discuss with humanism and uh, of course it can. Um, scientists, basic science, uh, natural science, look at particles, look at very simple things, and they ask how it works, how it works. And social science, humanities, look at very complex system, and they ask why it works like that. And that is very, very complicated. And we think of the mind, it's even much more complicated. So it's a huge challenge and we need to have this dialogue to discuss together without taking hard position, but with, by learning from each other. I was curious by one thing you mentioned, I think uh, with the discussion with Maya Burger, you are skeptical about rituals. <laughs> but among scientists, oh. so maybe it's a matter of de mini definition, among scientists there are people that look at the past, those are the archaeologists, and the archaeologists tell us since years that they have remains of rituals for funerals uh, since uh, you know, the great, great antiquity and before. So it seems that the humankind have also, has always used rituals to, uh, to accompany their dead people, or at least mourning. And I wondered if in Tibetan or in, uh, in, in, in your language you have the difference between rituals and mourning, which is accompanying a dead people. Huh? Mourning is some animal association with that. Recently I saw, I think, a Time magazine or Newsweek magazine this is some pictures, some elephant, uh, after their companion dies, they also mourning. And uh, some other sort of animal have that kind of uh, uh, ability. Chimpanzees. Uh, particularly, you see, the, uh, those social animals. Uh, but the ritual, <laughs> if you, I say the, if you sort of uh, describe ritual as something special sort of uh, activities, yeah. then I think those animals, especially when they are mating, some rituals there. <laughs> Isn't it? <Yes>. Dogs <laughs> or cats, or they something, some different sort of rituals. <laughs> and some sort of deers also, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shower. Yeah, well, oh, also ritual language. Uh, oh, ritual then, then uh, ritual in that sense, yes. That's culture, culture, or I don't know, certain physical sort of expression. Would you say that meditation is a ritual? Now, I think, frankly speaking, my English uh, very poor. I think often uh, when I speak English, I think without knowing exactly what is the meaning of that particular word. <laughs> so the ritual, I don't know real meaning. So, yes, I was trying a Tibetan word, 
That means a ritual with a sort of religious ritual with a ceremony and all that. So he's always pointed right, rightly so that elephants don't perform ceremony, but they do things uh, like putting things on the dead body. So what is the definition of a ritual? Isonez was wondering because of the English meaning. What does it I think, I think ritual in the sense certain physical sort of uh, activities, certain sort of verbal activities or voice, just sort of expression of certain sort of uh, sort of, uh, emotion. Mm -hmm. Then ritual, some way, automatically come. Right. Mm -hmm. But then ritual, you see, based on certain belief. But then uh, sometimes you see, too much sort of stress. Ritual is uh, meaningless without knowing the meaning. Oh. The meditation to oh, Training of mind mm. and ritual. Ritual, suppose, kasoda yala. Some lot train shake yala da usoda. It's just a, a ritual is a kind of a secondary branch of of mind training. It, it may help, but it's not mind training per se. Mm. So important, now for example, the Christian practitioner, real sort of effective, what's the day, practice is single pointed faith towards God. Then chanting with the music, these are what's the supporter. Extra, yes. Or the tea, mm. See, I saw the example this one gave that the music chanting is just like supporting or means to express one's faith, but it's not the core. Because it's a very psychological approach to the event of death, for instance, if you approach it from a very, from the psychological perspective. I think this is one aspect, but then we have the social aspect. And um, especially in, at the time of death, I think it's, very interesting to observe that people are seeking for right gestures at the right moment. And they can be either given by tradition, because they help to uh, live this moment, very difficult moment, or they can be, as we see today, invented. But it seems that these uh, acts, these practices are very important and do not seem to be avoidable. So I wonder whether you can approach it from both the sides. On the one way you have the psychological dimension, which is the inner experience, and at the same time you give expression to something which is outward and which mm. ritualizes events that are very difficult, and maybe you cannot understand immediately what is happening at the time yeah. of death, but rituals can help you. I mean, at least that's what we are taught that rituals can help you to frame that moment in such a way as to allow maybe this inner consciousness to grow in a longer process. Oh. I think uh, ritual, as you mentioned, something sort of spontaneous expression. Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, it's a right of freedom. Uh, someone is fond of that. Okay, you carry. <laughs> uh, and also is my freedom to express my skeptical. <laughs> That's also my freedom. <laughs> and my case, you see, Buddhist practice, such a sort of what's today, a realistic sort of approach, they really directly deal with emotion. But many Buddhists, including Tibetan Buddhists, you see, they, we don't care about this real method to deal with emotion. We simply carry these rituals. And the whole day some chanting, chanting, half sleep, half chanting. What use? <laughs> and some instrument, horn, or the sort of flu. Actually, this flu, very name is Teling, yes. Teminimbu. Means for a Chinese flute, so it's not even Tibetan. Oh. <laughs> 
I'm quite sure those Narendra masters, top masters of a Buddhist, Buddhist tradition, I think they never touched flu, I don't think. <laughs> uh, we are as followers of Narendra tradition, I think we must go the original, authentic tradition, not cultural aspect. We Tibetan much emphasis cultural aspect, and that's more attraction. Uh, then, uh, uh, one time, I met one Japanese who recently visited, I mean, that mean about, I think, 15 years ago. He recently visited Tibet. And, and he asked me, uh, oh, Buddhism, the very sort of message, very sort of the central practice is compassion. So some of the Tibetan monastery, some very wrathful deities, uh, like Asuda, like they look very wrathful and oh, and drinking blood like that. Uh, and one day, he uh, pilgrim, went. Uh, this is uh, some temple, and he saw some of the wrathful sort of. Uh, Mosque, 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 or some sort of image, or some drawing. Uh, that night, he lost his sleep <laughs> out of fear. <laughs> when he <laughs> go to sleep, reflect these wrathful sort of face, these things. So he lost his sleep. So he asked me, "Why? Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism in general, the essential sort of." Practice is compassion. Now, why are using these things? So it is true. We are forgetting the real practice and emphasis those kasoda, uh, those ritual or the, the, those certain things. Uh, and then tantric practice more involve ritual. So people uh, loves tantric practice without knowing real meaning, without carrying real practice, just these rituals. And also public. And the man talking to the Kudula and Sakshank. So you have to get a chance of Yaku with that. So there's also sacred dances and ritual which are present in dance. So it's a very nice uh, spectacle to see. A lot of hundreds of people come to watch that. And there are parts of ritual. One part is about uh, how to, you know, during the ritual, meditate on achieving awakening. And so the, then the ritual master does it very fast because not very entertaining. Mm -hmm. Another part is about to dispel obstacles and s slay the obstacle with symbols and things like that. Then they do very slow and they do it with a lot of theatrical gestures and so something like that. So therefore, uh, as far as Buddhist practice is concerned, I think we, I think, uh, neglect the real essence part, essential part. So therefore, uh, I publicly expressed my sort of skeptical about these uh, rituals. Ritual carried by understanding and some experience. Then okay. Uh, so that's why so I, I express. So Switzerland, free country. I use my own freedom of expression. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and I think Thank you, you very agree. Much. <laughs> and also, well, among the scientists, among the sort of scientist group, we have real free, real freedom, isn't it? Right. We have no sort of some, some kind of There's no taboo about whether you should speak or not speak and of course. sort of cultural uh, prohibition. Of of but I think you agree with uh, the, these people inventing new rituals because they want to go closer to what they experience. <laughs> you very much <laughs> insisted <laughs> that. 
The dialogue is turning into a lively but joyful debate about rituals. <laughs> so um, I think we're, the, the session is coming slowly by, uh, to the end. Oh, yes. And um, I would like just to remind, to, to remind a few key uh, things. We learned about preparing death, which is important. We learned about accompanying death by the medics in particular. Uh, and all these taboo that we have or these uncertainties. We learned a lot by en your encouragement for young and older researchers. Science should go ahead and not stay behind. And we learned about the fact that di the dialogue between science and human science and humanities is important. I would like to thank you very much, Your Holiness, Mr. Rika, Mr. Wangdu, and I would like to ask the rector to come on the stage to give his uh, closure lecture. Your Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this very special day, I have the extremely nice duty to come back for some concluding remarks. But this will not be a conclusion. In fact, today's discussion was intense during both sessions, but it cannot, it must not be concluded. Of course, the goal of the visit of His Holiness the Dalai Lama was to prepare this dialogue, to enjoy this day, and to continue the study of all perspectives on aging. I am convinced that all participants of this meeting will go back home tonight with a new vision on the topics we have discussed today. With a new understanding of aging, maybe with some doubts, but certainly with a stronger motivation for scientific work or personal thoughts. It is my great pleasure to thank all the people who made this event possible. First of all, of course, I would like to express my deep gratitude to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his willingness to share with us his experience and his extraordinary understanding of the fun fundamental questions of life, but also for his warm simplicity and his capability to be accessible for all of us. It was a great honor to have you on the campus of the University of Lausanne today, and the institution I represent would like to thank you very much for your presence. I also would like to express my special thanks to Mr. Tseten Shukyapa, representative of the Tibet office in Geneva, to Rikzin Namka Gyatso Rinpoche, and to the three associations, FPC Tibet, FPMT Gendun Drupa, and Rikzin Switzerland, who helped us a lot in the preparation of this visit. Finally, I will I would like to thank Professor Philippe Morillon, the scientific organizer of the meeting, Mr. Marc de Perrault, who coordinated the operations, and all the collaborators of the University of Lausanne who worked very hard during many weeks or months and who prepared this event with great care. I would like to conclude with my personal thanks to all participants for their interest and for this presence, their presence in this room. Now His Holiness will quit the University of Lausanne, will quit this room. Thank you for staying quiet for a few minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's... I think it's